Hello, everybody. I am joined today by Tim Choi, a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary at the Center for Military Security and Strategic Studies. And we're here to talk about naval diplomacy. Uh, Tim knows a whole lot about this. Um, a while back, he wrote uh, an interesting editorial for the Canadian Naval Review um, called Not for Sale, Trump, Greenland, and Danish Naval Diplomacy. And it was connected to this whole uh, Trump wanting to buy Greenland thing. And uh, Tim found a really interesting angle that included Danish naval diplomacy. So um, that's sort of departing point for this, uh, for this discussion. So uh, Tim, thanks a lot for uh, finding the time for this. Thanks for having me, Anders. So you wrote this article uh, about Danish naval diplomacy, as I mentioned in this incident in Greenland. And I thought it was really interesting. And uh, we could perhaps use that as a lens into the questions about uh, naval diplomacy. But before we get to that, perhaps we should just define what is actually naval diplomacy. Sure. Um, so we're going to start with there are multiple definitions, right? It's a concept that has been developed by different academics um, studying this subject for you know a good several decades now. But I think the most common definition, at least the foundational one, was the one put forward by James Cable back in the 1970s in his book called Gunboat Diplomacy. And it's the use or threat of naval force to influence the behavior of foreign governments. And that was his scope of analysis. And the important thing is that the force that is employed must not lead to war. If it leads to war, then you can say that the act of gunboat diplomacy has failed um, because you just end up going to war. So it has to be less than what is going to lead to an all out conflict. Um, and so, you know, Cable's gunboat diplomacy, um, his and his uh, sort of cohort at around that time period of the middle Cold War, um, they really restricted the theories to just state actors and enemies, right? Uh, just governments and other navies, really. Um, but more recent works have tried to emphasize that naval diplomacy can actually apply to allies and neutrals and non-state actors. Um, so, but regardless of whom the action is directed towards, there are varying levels of activity, and each of these get closer and closer to directly accomplishing the objective at hand. And this is, I think, Cable was, it still remains the um, best description of this um, ladder, as it were, um, between you know, actions versus outcomes. And so this relationship you know, between the naval action and the level of specificity of the outcome is, remains Cable's greatest contribution to the naval diplomacy literature. Um, and But even though Cable's notion of this levels of force ranging from expressive force where you're just kind of, you know, sending a ship somewhere without any idea of what it's supposed to accomplish, uh, all the way up to definitive force when you're trying to remove the actual cause of dispute, um, you know, he, Cable meant for that to apply to a state's opponents, but you can think of it to apply to allies and neutrals as well. And this is especially important when you consider newer um, naval diplomacy literature like Kevin Rowland's uh, work that came out in the mid 2010s, uh, which emphasizes naval diplomacy as really acts of communication, the communicative actions. And there's a lot of literature from, of course, communications theory that can go into the whole idea of when you're sending a ship or you're doing something with naval vessels, um, you know, what kind of message are you sending? So, yeah, I think that's. Well, stop that there. <laughs> okay. So if we now turn to this article you wrote about Greenland and Danish naval diplomacy and Trump wanting to buy the island. So uh, what actually happened and, and why do you think this is such a good example of successful naval diplomacy? Right. So the time period is August 2019, right, during the height of the Trump administration. And somebody leaked that uh, the president was considering buying Greenland from Denmark, um, as though you could actually do that, right? <laughs> Even though, as, as you know, all the listeners know, you know, at Greenlandic independence is solely up to the Greenlandic authorities themselves. You know, Denmark has no real say in this kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> But Trump, you know, he instead of claiming it was just like a fake news sort of thing, it's just a rumor made up by the fake news media, uh, he leaned into it. He said, you know, you know what? Yeah, you know, maybe Greenland should be un should be protectorate of the United States because it's necessary to ensure the security of the United States, especially given Greenland's physical geographic position between the United States and Russia. 
And of course, you know, that is factually, that is true, um, you know, throughout the entire Cold War, you know, that's why you have the air base at Thule, you know, and a whole chain of other radars that are up in Greenland, um, you know, all to make sure that the United States has, you know, a sufficient warning, early warning of incoming ballistic missiles or bombers and what have you, um, you know, should the worst happen. And so, you know, that was happening in that August 2019 time frame. And at the exact same time that this whole uh, thing was happening in the media, um, the United States Navy had one of its destroyers visit Greenlandic waters for the first time in, you know, as far as, you know, ever, as far as I know. Um, and that was a uh, USS Gravely, the first uh, Arleigh Burke class destroyer to actually visit the island. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's, you know, you guys know uh, an Arleigh Burke class destroyer. They're like the frontline service combatants of the United States Navy, right? Like 9,600 tons brimming with dozens of missiles, 96 vertical launch systems, you know, Aegis radars, all the, all the works, right? All the, you know, all the toys and bells and whistles. And it is the iconic American warship. It's the one that you see in all the Hollywood movies. It's the one that, you know, when you think of American warships, that's not an aircraft here. This is an Arleigh Burke class. Uh, and now it's selling off outside of Greenland, right? And, you know, you can imagine sort of what people would think if uh, this ship was seen in photographs of sailing on its own in Greenlandic waters while Trump was saying, oh, we, got, we might want to buy Greenland. Um, and that could have led to a whole bunch of... Um, you know, really escalated into something that would be much more serious. Um, but thankfully, at the same time that Gravely was visiting Greenlandic waters, the Danish Navy also did its first thing. Um, did something that was the first. It deployed the second squadron frigates to Greenland for the first time that summer. And so when Gravely arrived in Greenland, uh, she was met by Absalon. Um, you know, at the time, of course, she wasn't re-rated as a frigate, but still, you know, generally speaking, they're, that's what they were. Um, and so... You know, as the war of words continue between Washington and Copenhagen with nukes sort of trapped in the middle, uh, you know, got two big gray warships, roughly the same size. You know, they took part in some friendly passing exercises like good allies, good friends would do. Right. And, you know, very, you know, as an example of naval diplomacy, Absalom was in the right space at the right time. You know, her presence demonstrated that Denmark had the military means to be present and capable of defending Greenland with military forces that were at least visually speaking, equivalent to the best that the Americans had to offer. Um, and in a way, the success of this was the fact that it wasn't really well advertised. Um, nobody really picked up on it. Nobody ran with it as some sort of um, greater messaging, greater American strategy to take Greenland by force. Um, and so the presence of Gravely in Greenland during this heated um, diplomatic incident was not at all noticed by major news outlets. And that was a success, right? Um, and I suggest that this is due to the presence of Absalon, which accomplished two things. One, it showed American Trump supporters that Denmark had a capable presence in the Arctic. Greenland was not defenseless. And secondly, it showed Danish citizens that their military was capable and able to defend the Danish kingdom's farthest territories being caught up in great power competition. Um, therefore, you know, the indication of success was that Gravely's presence in Greenland was not noticed and it did not contribute to a worsening of the relations between the two countries. Um, you, so the argument here then you guess, is that you can imagine the counterfactual um, that if Gravely had shown up off Nuuk, you know, outside, um, you know, off the small cliffs of Nuuk on its own without any Danish escort, the image of that while Trump was saying we're going to buy Greenland, uh, you know, could have made very everything so much worse, right? Like a big American warship buying American flag outside of the Greenlandic capital while, you, you know, Trump was saying he's you know actually serious about the proposal. You know, that could have really escalated things. And the, the fact that it didn't, you know, was an example, I think, of, um, you know, the initial naval diplomacy being in the right place in the right time. So uh, one of your sentiments in, in your editorial seems to be that, this particular piece of naval diplomacy worked so well because Denmark participated with Absalon, which is a frigate. Mm -hmm. um, so that leads me to the question of what does it require uh, to do naval diplomacy? Because uh, Denmark operates with large ships around Greenland all the time, but, but they're OPVs and... Um, do they qualify as ships that can do naval diplomacy? What what does it take? 
Yeah, so I think it's definitely one of those things where it depends on the specific situation and the specific actors involved. Like we, you know, briefly discussed at the beginning about number of diplomacy, you know, you can direct it towards allies, enemies, um, neutrals, you know, non-state actors, state actors, uh, re and really depends on the situation at hand. And I think in most situations, you know, a relatively friendly unit like a Thetis class or a nude class, um, OPV, you'll be more than sufficient to indicate, you know, Denmark's uh, interest and commitment to Greenland and Faroe's uh, maritime security and sovereignty. Um, but in the specific heightened political situation of August 2019, I think having that large service combatant was key to really drive home the point that Denmark was capable of handling security in the North Atlantic and the Arctic. Um, <clears throat> there is, I think, at least in the general public, that a general impression that the more imposing physically imposing the ship, the greater the public impression is of that country's interest in a certain matter. Um, there's a reason why we always talk about, you know, U.S. aircraft carriers as 100,000 tons of diplomacy, right? Um, you know, bigger is better, as they <laughs> say, um, you know, even if it is at the end outcome, um, not really, you know, combat capabilities in that, in most contexts aren't really all that important, is the impression that it gives. And, you know, Obviously, there are those in the military and certain academic communities who actually know about individual ship capabilities, um, and they can have better, not you know, knowledge of how important a given presence is. You know, how much of it is a big change from existing practices, um, and how much does it represent a serious contribution. Um, but generally, as far as the average layperson knows, you know, the bigger the ship, the greater the indicated interest in an area. So. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, most most times I don't think it requires a frigate, but having one, it certainly doesn't it certainly helps. Um, you know, it doesn't hurt. And, you know, that it is the ultimate state representative, um, at least for the Danish Navy. Right. And uh, Absalon and who felt ivory class uh, frigates, you know, um, and they're the ones that you would send to show you know, the maximum amount of Danish interest in a given region. And I mean, in this case, it worked really well, especially when you're talking about supposedly an ally, but also, you know, a world superpower. Uh, you really need to have something there to uh, match that interest. Yeah, looks matter. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I want to ask you that, you know, recently an article was published in War on the Rocks that touches on the question of uh, unmanned technology and um you know, ships sailing without a crew uh, that and, and could they be used for freedom of navigation operations and uh, which basically is also a kind of naval diplomacy. So I, I want to ask you about uh, what what particular possibilities and challenges do we find with unmanned technology in regard to naval diplomacy? Um, is it is, is it can you use it at all? Is it workable or no? I think there's some. Um a very sort of a narrow band um, of activities in which it would work. And, you know, like we mentioned at the beginning, naval diplomacy has so many aspects. It could be a very friendly, supportive thing to show that, you know, you're supporting an ally. It could be something that you try to use to coerce an opponent into doing what you want. Um, but let's let's assume this scenario of, you know, the high end sort of thing where you're trying to coerce an opponent into doing something you want. And I think at the heart of naval diplomacy at that um in that manifestation is the notion that you can use force to accomplish objectives without leading it without leading to war and a part of that <clears throat> sorry a part of that is dependent upon the risk calculations by the parties involved would your opponent rather give you what you want instead of going to war and so there needs to be a credible risk of things escalating into a wartime situation um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, uncrewed vehicles, whether they're aircraft or, you know, surface vessels or underwater vessels, um, you know, so far, um, have, as has been demonstrated in state practice, they do not have this credibility. There have been numerous instances of UAVs or UVs being stolen or hijacked or shot down, and none of those really led to a major war or, you know, major escalation of um, military force. And so fundamentally, uncrewed vehicles, they don't really seem to have the ability to coerce an opponent into doing what the user wants or otherwise face a war that they cannot win. Um, 
And I mean, that being said, you know, uncrewed vehicles, I think they certainly have some role across the spectrum of naval diplomatic dif- activities, um, but they're probably more useful for in a supporting role, like intelligence gathering. Um, to, and then you would use that intelligence that's gathered as your course of, um, you know, evidence. Um, and so it's more useful in that support role rather than in the pointy end of diplomacy, shall we say. Um, and they would probably be more useful to demonstrate support for allies, um, you know, perhaps to provide more time domain awareness and general, you know, search and rescue, perhaps, uh, but less so for coercing a hostile actor that can just conduct their own act of definitive force, gunboat diplomacy, uh, to remove your offending uncrewed vehicle without having to worry about escalating to a full-out war. Um, and so in that sense, rat, you know, trying to use a naval diplomacy with, you um, uncrewed vehicles, odds are that uncrewed vehicle will become the victim rather than the um, assailant um, in most scenarios. Now, you know, within the context of phone ops and things like that, within where the international legal um, framework matters, I think uncrewed vehicles could be a good litmus test of the adherence of a given actor to the rule of law. Um, do they play nicely or do they not? And, um, you know, it's useful in that sense, but in terms of changing the behavior of an opponent that is not adhering to the rule of law, then I don't think it's uh, it plays you know a major or significant role in that regard. So yeah, yeah, and probably I I'd assume there are also kinds of extra risks in in that. Uh, how well do you control the movements of this un- unmanned system? And it's pretty easy to imagine that you could spin this into a s- sort of situation where this unmanned system actually had a collision with a fishing boat or whatever, and you turn it into a really bad story because you send your boat through here and it was unsafe. It didn't. So it, mm. it can backfire in these ways, I guess. Absolutely. Also. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 All these uh, digital linkages it makes it vulnerable mm. to interception and. Hijack. Um, one of the uh, the last thing I want to touch on is is sort of the question of of um, what does what does it take to sort of use naval diplomacy strategically. A while ago, uh, I, I was contacted by a foreign student from a staff college who wanted to use uh, sort of wanted to write a thesis on how different NATO countries use have strategies on naval diplomacy. And I thought it was a little embarrassing uh, to tell her that, to my knowledge, Denmark doesn't have such a strategy. Um, and that made me think, okay, wh- what if we wanted to make one? Like, um, what would that require? What are the most important ingredients to include in such a strategy? What do you need to c- consider when, when sort of contemplating uh, where to use naval diplomacy and w- where it might be successful and where not to use it? Um, so, you know, <clears throat> as you probably know, there isn't a lot of good works on this kind of thing. Um, and so probably my answer is not this similar to yours. Um, <laughs> also somewhat embarrassing. Um, but, you know, I think I'll settle on the side that I'm not sure a long term naval diplomatic strategy is actually viable, um, at least not across the entire spectrum of conflict and, you know, contestation. Um, in the instance of Gravely and Absalon, Absalon's success came from, you know, a 2016 assessment on the military requirements in the Arctic, not the diplomatic requirements in the Arctic. And that requirement was for improved airspace surveillance over Greenland. That had nothing to do with, you know, countering an American destroyer or any other uh, vessel in the region. And, you know, so it's very much a, it comes from being in the right place at the right time. Um, and you know, basically having presence is the um, I think most important ingredient of it all. But you know, in terms of a few other um, ingredients, or at least things that you should think of when considering you know naval diplomacy um, for grander strategic or political objectives, it's uh, firstly you have to consider which party do you want your action to appeal to. You know, who's who's the audience? Is it another country's military? Is it their politicians? Is it their overly focused citizens? Um, is it your own of all those three things? And secondly, is that is the action that you intend, is it an offensive one or is it a supportive one? Do you try, are you trying to eject you know, a violation from a particular space or do you want to welcome them in such a way that shows that you're aware of their concerns and are able to address them? 
And of course, finally, you know, I mentioned this right at the beginning, presence, 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 right? It's about the material, about the physical presence of something. Um, Absalon showed us that, you know, situations occur about warning, um, you know, and the surest guarantee of being able to react to an adversary's actions is to be present. Um, for a region like the Arctic, where the seas are covered in ice for much of the year, or at least some parts of the uh, seas, you have to also be aware of which ships from other countries which are interested in your regions can actually sail in the ice. If it's in a deep winter where the Greenlandic coast is locked in ice, um, you know, for example, no Russian or, you know, American or Chinese warships can be in there, right? And so correspondingly, you don't need to have a high-end combatant in that region. You can, you know, be, you're more than capable of, um, you know, of meeting anyone who's going to be there with your OPVs as you currently do. Uh, in the summer, you know, this, of course, changes. And that's, you know, exactly why Gravely was there in August, um, you know, where the, the waters open up and basically anybody with vessel can be there. Um, <clears throat> and so being well aware of who can be in these particular environmental um, situations, that is a very important part then of um, naval diplomacy, at least in, I think, the Arctic regions. So, yeah, presence. <laughs>